So welcome everybody to today's IP Interactive Dialogue webinar. Uh, the topic this morning is Heartland and Lexmark, the business impact. <clears throat> uh, my name is Gina Cornelia. I'm a patent partner in the Denver office of Dorsey and Whitney. And today you'll also be hearing from Case Collard, who's a partner also in the Denver office uh, in IP litigation department. Hi, everybody. And this is meant to be an interactive experience, so if you have any questions or want, uh, want to have any comments, go ahead and provide those comments in the participate, participant feedback window. Uh, I think it should be on the left-hand side of the webinar window. And we'll, we'll interrupt the, the discussion as we go as comments come in. Um, Gina, I thought maybe I would say a little bit about my practice area and experience, and maybe you could do the same, and then sure. before we get started. Um, so, uh, as Gina said, my name is Case Collard. My practice focuses on uh, patent litigation, and actually, it's a little broader than that. I uh, do all sorts of what I would probably call technology litigation, so whether that is based off trade secrets or a license agreement um, or patent or trademark or copyright, uh, I have a lot of experience in, in those areas. I also am admitted in California and practice uh, somewhat extensively in California. And, uh, you know, Dorsey is an international firm and we end up having cases all over the country and all over the world. So uh, that's a little bit about my practice. And, and if I would say one takeaway, if you have a technology dispute, whatever that might be, that's something that uh, I, I or, or folks here at Dorsey have, have uh, lots of experience with. Great. And a little bit about me. I mainly focus on patent prosecution, but my practice involves all types of client counseling, especially as it relates to um, different licensing agreements and frequent kind of manufacturing and production disputes in China and other jurisdictions. <laughs> So I think the one way we wanted to get started is, Case, why did you think this topic would be interesting to talk about and write for a conversation at this time? So, you know, every year we've had, for the last about five years, we've had two or three patent decisions from the Supreme Court, which uh, it has certainly um, been interesting from a practice perspective. But, you know, from a business perspective, the uh, with each of these decisions, business strategy needs to adjust and change. And the two big decisions from um, from the last court session, Heartland and, and Lexmark, really do have a significant impact on business strategy. So it's important to understand what those mean. And we're going to get pretty detailed about some of the possible implications of these cases. But if you have one takeaway from this webinar, I want you to have a general understanding of what Heartland is and how it's, you know, how venue may change. And then the same with Lexmark, uh, so that whether it does impact your company's business model or it doesn't, you have a sense of at least what that is and what questions you should ask and, and hopefully you can spot issues related to either of these two cases as they come up. Uh, I think for both of these cases, they're going to end up having a long tail. We're already analyzing um, sort of the aftermath of, of Heartland and not quite as much on Lexmark, but uh, I want to just key everybody into those issues so as they develop, they, uh, we know what's going on and we can and think about how they affect your business. So I think it would be helpful to have a quick refresh just on what the Heartland decision was. Uh, can you walk us through that case? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Heartland was, and, and we have a little bit of the facts here about what was going on in, in Heartland. And Heartland was incorporated and had its principal pay, place of business in Indiana. And they were sued in Delaware. And they didn't have any presence in Delaware other than shipping products there. And they challenged... Um, they challenged the, whether or not that venue was appropriate that they be sued in Delaware, and they went back to the uh, two controlling venue statutes to try to, uh, to challenge that. And honestly, it was a little bit of uh, 
challenge in both of these cases, I think that is true. There's another case that's going on right now that I get uh, the oil states case. It's a, a patent case that ha there's a common thread among all three of these. The, that thread is that they really go back to some core litigation and patent concepts to say, is venue proper? I mean, this is something you're doing on your CIPRO exam that we can all remember is saying, you know, oh, is venue proper as you go through your checklist of things for uh, a litigation and is there jurisdiction? And I mean, the new oil states case is uh, it's not new, but the oil states case that's going to be in the Supreme Court this year is going back to constitutional issues of, of jurisdiction. And the same way for Lexmark, it's going back to these ancient <laughs> common law doctrines about patent exhaustion. What I want to say about that is that these are cases that have really changed the landscape of how we're practicing now. And it's because some attorney that was working on this case took the time to go back and read the, ven the key venue statutes and not just say, well, you know, lots of cases are in Delaware. We ship product to Delaware. I'm sure venue is proper there. Uh, they really looked at this and challenged this and had a judge that was receptive to that. And that's what happened here is that Heartland said, you know, we really don't have much of a tie. We don't have a regular and established place of business. And I don't know that there would be personal jurisdiction over us in Delaware. Let's take a shot at this and see if we can get this moved to a more favorable venue uh, from our perspective. And um, as has been the um, trend, the Federal Circuit has not has been frequently overturned by the Supreme Court. A lot of the recent uh, Supreme Court decisions have unanimously overturned the uh, Federal Circuit. And that's what happened here. The Federal Circuit was reversed. Um, and the, the key takeaway here, and this is one of those few key takeaways that we want to make sure you have, is that the Supreme Court narrowed where venue is appropriate in patent infringement actions. And you'll see in that bottom bullet, uh, a corporation is subject to venue only where it is incorporated or has a regular and established place of business. And that's the the takeaway there is that's narrower than it was uh, before. And it raises, so, so that's the law, that's the background of how we got here, and that has raised some questions going forward. So I, I think just kind of off, right off the bat, one thing that jumps to mind is how does this apply to foreign defendants that are typically uh, sued in the United States for patent infringement? Uh, I guess, can you walk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. So you've got, always got, if you've got a truly foreign defendant, if it is a, you know, Chinese manufacturer that, that is making product that is infringing your patent, um, you've got a myriad of challenges, and venue is only one of those. But this, you know, obviously for today's purposes, we're going to talk about uh, venue. And the... The old rule, so the clear old rule before Heartland, and, and, and what I would say is Heartland in this respect has not provided a lot of clarity. If anything, it's perhaps a little more complicated than it was uh, prior to this decision for foreign defendants. But the, um, the old rule was in any judicial district, basically. So you, you didn't have to worry as much about uh, venue over foreign defendants before. You could sue them in any judicial district for patent infringement. Um, and so that, that, that was helpful for a patent holder because you have, another, you have a number of challenges with serving them and, and, um, and other things, but at least for venue, you could be in any district. I understand one strategy typically with foreign defendants is to not only file against the foreign defendant, but also against U.S. subsidiaries. Do you think that this takes that into account now? I, I think that that is a good way to try and give yourself a little more certainty. If there is a U.S. subsidiary, um, one of the things you can do now, and so I'll talk a little bit more about the uncertainty with venue over a foreign defendant, but just if you trust me for a moment and I say <laughs> it's a little more uncertain in light of Heartland, um, then one way to navigate that is to include a U.S. subsidiary 
if you do know the state of incorporation or where they have could you know have a regular uh, place in, of conducting business sorry I have to get the language right every time regular and established place of business then that gives you a foothold uh, and a, and I guess a backstop if your mm -hmm. venue over the the venue over the um, foreign defendant is challenged you at least have uh, hopefully you know you have appropriate venue over the uh, subsidiary, the domestic subsidiary. And so foreign businesses, I guess, should be should expect then that essentially status quo, unless they have a U.S. subsidiary, in which case it might be likely in the principal place of business. I think that's right. And the one thing I would say, and it, it all this depends, and I want to go back actually, to, <laughs> we don't have to actually go back on the slides, but one of the slides, the very first slides where I said, you know, what questions are we asking? That there's two sides to all of this, of course. You know, where might your company get sued for patent infringement? But if you have a patent to enforce, what venues can you use? Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same for Lexmark, and we'll be talking about business models uh, when we get to, to that portion of the discussion. And there's always two sides of that. Can you protect your business model using your patent, and then someone accusing uh, your company of infringing a patent, are they doing so appropriately in light of, of it? patent exhaustion and those doctrines. So there's always two sides to these mm -hmm. questions. And to, to your point, Gina, the question uh, about, you know, if you are or uh, are overseeing a, a foreign defendant, what can you expect? You can probably expect your domestic subsidiary to be tied in. Um, and the other thing, the, so the, the real answer to your question is until we get more clarity on venue and foreign defendants, challenge venue. Yep. Um, and, and I think that that wouldn't have always been true for foreign defendants because the law for a while was pretty settled uh, and is now a little bit unsettled with Heartland. Um, and I won't get too into that, but there is just a, a relationship. Well, first of all, Heartland says specifically that it's not trying to uh, decide the implications of its ruling. It, it, it's saying, this is our ruling. I don't know what the implications are for foreign defendants. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the Heartland decision didn't comment on, on that. Um, but there are multiple venue statutes. There's general and patent venue statutes. So the how these interplay with foreign defendants is unclear. And so until that's clear, clarified, either because Congress uh, amends the venue statutes or a court provides more clarity on the impact of Heartland um, on de venue over foreign defendants. Until that's clear, you should, A, be researching that if you have a patent you're enforcing against a foreign defendant and trying to take your, you know, sort of uh, uh, best strategy going forward in light of, of the fact there is some uncertainty. And if you are a foreign entity, you should be challenging venue if, if you're, um, Accuse, have a suit for patent infringement filed against you. So I think the, the biggest change, and correct me if I'm wrong, is going to be the Eastern District of Texas, uh, known for the rocket docket and used to be the number one place to file. What, what do you see as being the biggest change there? So Henry Cray, the case that we have cited here, is in the news already as sort of the aftermath of, of Heartland. When Heartland came out, everybody was able to read that and say, oh man, this could mean, this could have a, a very serious impact on Eastern District of Texas and how it has uh, operated. And I think that over the years, I mean, the Eastern District of Texas has now been the primary patent venue for, I don't know, 15 years um, or more. And so over the years, there have been certain legal changes that perhaps steered some cases away, tightening of venue, individual venue decisions, or jurisdiction decisions that moved cases out of ED Texas, or um, encouraged plaintiffs to use other venues. This case, when it came out, I mean, the initial reaction was, is this or could this be the death knell for patent litigation in the Eastern District of Texas? Um, and this Cray case is one of the, is the first case in which the Federal Circuit was 
reviewing a venue decision in the Eastern District of Texas after Heartland. Um, and so I, it was Judge Gilstrap, I believe, said, nope, venue's appropriate. We're going to keep it here. And the Federal Circuit said, no, nope, you're not going to keep it here. Uh, it doesn't meet regular and established place of business test from Heartland. And, and this venue, venue isn't proper. Um, and so that was, this is uh, the first, First time the Federal Circuit has provided its, its oversight on Eastern District of Texas and started perhaps the move for um, of cases to a, a new district based on venue. So one question that we've got is what counts as a physical place in the district, especially with the increase in tele commuting and uh, you know with employees being located in a lot of different uh, geographical locations? That's a great question. Virtual spaces or electronic communications do not count. Um, it must be a physical geographical location from which uh, the business of the defendant is carried out. Um, so that is trying to provide a little more specificity mm -hmm. about what that means. Um, but, you know, there's still obviously some room for, for debate about what, what might qualify or what might not qualify for that. So, you know, another, I guess, related question would be for, you know, big companies that have multiple different kind of business interests, so say a big um, consumer products company that, has, that gets sued for patent infringement on their technical products but also has retail stores, do these retail stores, would they count as this type of, um, you know, physical place of business? Because I think there could be an argument that it's not really the same business part that's being accused of patent infringement. Right. I think that that, I mean, what I, what I take from your question, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there are a lot of large companies that have such a broad range of products and business lines that they may have one business line that's very technical and... Uh, it, it has very little to do with a retail location. And then they have, may have a retail location that sells, you know, non-technology goods, but that that's their retail location and they may not be related at all. Is that? Yep. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know for sure, obviously, how any of that would come out, but I think that, you know, the idea behind venue conceptually is, is a question of, is this a, an appropriate, um, location to carry this out, to have this litigation. And if a company does have the physical place of um, operations there, even though if they don't sell the actual product that's accused there, that's probably good enough for venue purposes. But I think that it's something to, to think about, especially if your company has a really diverse array of operations, to say, you know, okay, where, what are we doing in this, and what are the implications of this from a uh, legal standpoint about whether or not you know we're going to be defending suits all across the country because of this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and this, and what I would say about that is, um, we're focused on venue. Heartland was a venue case. You always have to be thinking about jurisdiction. There has been recent, you know, these they tend to go hand in hand, but there's been a lot of recent jurisdiction case law at the Supreme Court, not necessarily specific to patent, but it applies to patent cases as well about where jurisdiction is proper for this type of company. I mean, that's what, you know, you're asking. It was a Mercedes-Benz Mercedes was the, the case. So, you know, a co co international company um, with operations all over the United States that took a rather narrow view of jurisdiction. So I think you always, it's great to be thinking about the from thinking about this from a venue perspective, but you should also be sure to keep jurisdiction in mind. Okay, great. <clears throat> so one of the things I want to mention, though, before we move on from this slide, is about uh, some other, to the extent we can be a little more specific about these one, two, three, uh, you know, what the requirements we're looking for are. Um, you know, we said virtual spaces don't count. Sporadic or temporary activity that uh, is not going to meet the, the definition of regular and established. And then the other is it's not enough to just have an 
employee doing some work from there. It has to be established or ratified by the corporation. So if you have somebody who's telecommuting and they live in, you know, Florida, and then they move to Galveston. Yeah, they move to Galveston. <laughs> and they move to Marshall, Texas. Um, you know, I, I, that's not the same as having a regular place of, of business um, in that district. So. So there shouldn't be any surprises, I guess, from that standpoint. Of the company didn't really know it had a place of business. It's more on the actual, some sort of main physical presence. I think that's right. Yes, that's right. And um, again, this gets to like to the extent there's a core takeaway from this part of our discussion about Heartland. It's narrower than it was before. So if you have a patent to enforce, you need to be more thoughtful about the venue you choose, know that it's narrow, and if you are accused of infringing a patent, you need to question venue um, more rigorously than you may have before. And so it's narrower than it was. Key into that, regardless of which side of, of uh, the patent infringement uh, dispute that you may be on. Okay. Do you, um, I think you have some statistics about a, kind of showing the drastic change. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as I mentioned, when the when the case, when Heartland first came out, people said, oh, man, could this be, could this be all for the Eastern District of Texas? Um, and it really has taken a toll. So, you know, as you can see there, dramatic decline. It went from, it's kind of remarkable, actually, that it went from 40% of new cases to 15% of newly filed cases. 15% is still a lot, as you can see, it's still the second most uh, second most popular venue for new actions. But you know, going from 40% to 15 is, is really quite remarkable. So I think that you know what happens here. Certainly, there is a lot of uh, I don't know, I don't know like legend about East Texas <laughs> juries. <laughs> says, you know, we want our East Texas jury to decide this case because we're a patent holder and we think East Texas juries are so favorable to patent holders. But I think that there's a large part of the uh, preference for the Eastern District of Texas is based on the courts and the judges being familiar with patent cases mm -hmm. and saying, you know, yep, I know how to do this step, you know, this step of the infringement contentions and, and invalidity contentions. We handle that all the time. This is how I like to do it. This is your date. You've got, you know, two months, as opposed to a jurisdiction in which the court maybe gets, uh, the, the judge you're assigned to maybe has one patent case a year or one every couple of years and having really established procedures. And so I, I do have a point coming up. <laughs> My point coming up is that um, the reason people are still going to be going to Eastern District of Texas and maybe stretching the venue statute as much as they can is for both of those reasons. Mm -hmm. And that Eastern District of Texas will remain as pop. I guess that what I would say is this will remain as popular as it can possibly in light of the new restricted venue yeah. uh, statute because there are uh, real considerations that, that patent holders take into account when they are, are choosing that. And so, you know, that's why it's still number two, even even though the new rule has restricted it so much. Yeah, so it sounds like based on um, this, that it, for the large companies that have large presence in most places, including the Eastern District, it's not going to really be affected. It's going to be that you know, mid-sized companies or depending on the type of company that doesn't have a retail store or some sort of place of business. I think that's right, Gina, and that's something that, you know, is just a fact of life for companies that have a presence like that, a significant presence all across the country. Um, and I, I think that to the extent you can an analogize to other areas of law, um, you know, a company that has stores in every state knows that they're going to have employment issues in every state potentially. Mm -hmm. And so they prepare for that and, um, and manage that. And I think that's similar from a patent perspective. The, the reason we cited this ProWire v. Apple case, which is a Delaware case here, is that it, it does um, reinforce the, the point you just made. If, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you're, if your company has physical locations all over the, the country, 
then you then you will still be appropriate over you your company in um, almost any uh, jurisdiction. So I guess dovetailing off of that, um, given that most corporations are uh, incorporated in Delaware, how do you think that's going to affect the venue going forward? So, you know, Delaware was already a popular location because of that, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of the judges in Delaware have good experience with um, patent cases. And so, you know, it was already pretty popular, and now it's, it's number one. Um, and so it, it's almost, it's not quite the, the flip side uh, of, of the volume of cases, uh, but it's actually pretty close to say, you know, that, that Delaware has, you know, gone up to almost 30% uh, from being 12% last year. And that seems to me to be what we're going to see moving forward. You know, I think one of the things that litigants on both sides are always searching for, which is uh, a little bit, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but they're always searching for certainty, mm -hmm. and litigation is inherently uncertain. And so, you know, knowing that you're going to, because you, you sue a company in their state of incorporation, and as, as a company, knowing that you're going to have to be prepared to defend in your state of incorporation, that certainty and, and setting that question aside in the lawsuit and saying, all right, well, I won't have to fight to spend resources uh, fighting about venue is, is really valuable, and so I think that there's it's unlikely that this trend will change. I think that Delaware is going to remain popular, but there is, um, as you can see, <laughs> that Delaware has uh, some of its own challenges. The, um, the there are judicial vacancies. There's just not a lot of bandwidth to get these cases processed and heard in a timely manner, um, and you know. I have certainly seen it with clients that have cases that have been, um, well, I'll put it this way. When I have somebody talking to me about a patent infringement case and I have to tell them the likely time to trial, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, but it could be, you know, it's almost certainly over two years. Depending on the jurisdiction, it could be three years and I have to prepare them to, for four years. I mean, that that delay really, really impacts the decision that they make about filing a suit mm -hmm. because they may have um, they may either know they're going to have a complete different set of considerations about business considerations in two years that they don't want to be dealing with a lawsuit getting ready for trial versus what they you know the problem they're having today with someone infringing so it, it forces attorneys that sort of delay forces attorneys and clients, both patent holders and folks that are accused of infringement, to really factor in and try and do a little bit of fortune telling to say, what's it going to be like in two years? So how do I want to manage this dispute now, knowing uh, what the timeline looks like? And so that's something that's going to come up in Delaware, at least until all those uh, positions are filled. Okay. So are there, um, I guess, what are the other main venues you think uh, have, that will have been affected? So. The, what we've done here, and, and on this slide, is just looked at the next uh, third, fourth, fifth most popular after Eastern District of Texas and after Delaware. Um, Central District of California has the third most favored venues. I, I guess what I would say is I, there's not a real trend in these three, uh -huh. except for the significant increase in Northern District of California. Um, I think that for the Central District of California, in the Northern District of California, a lot of that's really driven by the fact that there's so much business activity there. And so there are a lot of headquarters that in those two districts and that drives the, the patent litigation. And especially in the Northern District, so much of it is um, high tech and very, a lot of the business being conducted there, there's a lot of patents covering all that business. And so that leads to uh, patent disputes there. So I think we may see, um, you know, to the extent that Delaware was not a perfect inverse of the change in Eastern District of Texas, mm -hmm. Eastern District of Texas went from about 40% to a little under 15%. Delaware went from a little under 15% to about 30%. So where's that other 10%? And I think that you're going to see it going to sort of uh, the home court of the accused infringer. Yeah. And maybe we've seen 
a bigger increase in Northern District of California because that happens to be more the home court of more accused infringers. But I think we're going to see, you know, whether it's um, Minnesota or Colorado or, you know, wherever it may be, I think you're going to see a slight uptick in all those jurisdictions sort of, or, you know, uh, Eastern District of Washington or Western District of Washington, wherever it is, uh, you're going to see slight upticks based on the amount of business activity involving, uh, you know, uh, patented technology. technology. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, so I guess, can you walk us through a couple of the main takeaways from a litigation perspective um, with this Heartland decision? Absolutely. So, um, you know, trying to repeat these a few times, because it's really the, the takeaway here. I don't expect uh, anybody to, to recite to, you know, their spouse when they get home, oh, yeah, this is exactly what happened in, in Heartland, <laughs> and the, these are the statistics down to two decimal places. Uh, but fewer venue options. And I think this increased certainty, I should, put a, I should have put a caveat there, because that's for domestic. I think domestically there is some increased certainty about where companies are, are likely to be subject to suit, uh, but that for foreign defendants, there is some actually the opposite. It's mm -hmm. a little increased uncertainty. Um, and then, so, you know, if you are taking this back and you are uh, in-house counsel and you, you want to have a discussion with the business folks about, you know, these changes, to me, this is the question. This is the question I would recommend to at least, you know, think about in which jurisdictions does your company have a regular established place of business? I mean, you know where you're incorporated, so, mm -hmm. like, let's check that one off the list. And maybe you know you have uh, stores in 50 states, and so, you know, that's, there you go. You know, yeah. you, you need to be planning for this in a similar way that you might think about employment litigation to say, okay, we need to have a good spectrum of available counselors so that if we have an issue in Kentucky, we at least know who to start with and ask about, you know, IP litigation in Kentucky. Um, but maybe not, you know, maybe you have one or two offices. And so you can say, you know, we have an office in Phoenix and Denver. And so, you know, we, and we're incorporated in Delaware. So we're going to make sure we, you know, have our advice our IP litigation advice sort of calculated and calibrated for those jurisdictions. And maybe if you're on the fence about opening an Eastern District of Texas store and you don't need to, <laughs> don't. I think that's probably been the advice for like 15 <laughs> years because, you know, a lot of plaintiffs did that. They open a storefront and say, you know, to get, make sure that they could try and it, it didn't work. I'll just say that. It didn't always work. But yes, I think that that, uh, consideration has been there for a long time if you are uh, maybe Marshall and uh, McKinney and some of these towns have not gotten a, a store that they would have as quick as they would have <laughs> I don't know I think they've gotten a lot of uh, a business from all the, the litigation and the lawyers that come there to litigate those cases yep so uh, I think turning now to Lexmark uh, if you could give us just a quick refresh of what the holding was and what it was about um, to help everyone kind of set up the next discussion. So this diagram we, we'll test on after the presentation. Um, it, you know, this Lexmark had two, Lexmark is about business models, that's what I would say, and how you can use patent, how you can or cannot use a patent to um, protect your product and how that product fits into your business model. So Lexmark's business model offered consumers two choices. They pay full price for a printer cartridge and do what they want with it, or they pay a lower price and they can return that cartridge to Lexmark to have it recharged with more ink. Um, there is an industry of third-party companies that will recharge your printer cartridge that's not sending it back to Lexmark, the manufacturer. It's, and you can see on this diagram, it's as a consumer, you had paid full price, then go for it. Uh, you know, um, submit your cartridge to the, the remanufacturer, 
and they'll recharge it for you and they'll send it back to you. But under Lexmark's policy, if you had done this discounted return program, you are not allowed to send your cartridge to the remanufacturer and get it recharged. And the suit by Lexmark was against a remanufacturer to say, this violates our, our patent rights. Um, so to cut to the chase, Lexmark lost. The remanufacturer is allowed to, to recharge those printer cartridges, and Lexmark can't, it, it, it makes a lot of, this case, to me this case makes some intuitive sense. Lexmark sold the printer cartridge. Once it's sold the printer cartridge to the uh, U.S. consumer, that consumer can do what they want. If they want to send it to, uh, you know, the, menu, the third party to get it recharged, they can. Um, and, and that's what the court found. And the court really drew in old patent right exhaustion and a lot of those older concepts and then married that with contract law and said, you know, you may have a contract with somebody that I'm selling you, um, I'm selling you this item, there's a contract accompanying it, you can use it in these certain ways, but you can't use it in other ways. That's just contract law. Um, but, and so that, the, the Supreme Court very clearly signaled that that avenue was still open to Lexmark or another company that wants to have some control over a product after sale. Um, what the Supreme Court said is you can't have a patent suit after you say sell that. So that's what's going on in Lexmark um, on printer cartridges. So this is what sort of we were talking about with exhaustion, this first sale doctrine. Um, and that is the patent doctrine that the Supreme Court reinvigorated a little bit and said, nope, you know, you can't use these patent statutes to enforce these rights against somebody on, a, on an item you've already sold and gotten paid for. So I, basically what you're saying is if something sold in a foreign country is imported back in, that doesn't cover the importation right a patentee has. So that was even I, the Supreme Court going sort of a step further, I think, with this outside the United States sale being covered by this doctrine as well. You know, if they had wanted to do a more uh, limited ruling, they could have not discussed sales outside the United States. But um, I think they had to. The impression case, uh, the impression business included. It, we don't have to go back to that diagram. Well, actually, let's go back to the diagram. <laughs> Included overseas spent cartridges being imported to the U.S. So I guess I should say that they, they didn't really have a choice. They had to address yeah. this issue. Um, but the 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 fact that Lexmark lost on that issue too opens up um, a broader level of exhaustion. I actually want to say that there's some, and I'm sorry, I don't have a full site here, but the Lord, the SCOTUS cited something from Lord Coke, which from, was from 1628 yeah, on this yeah. doctor. So that's 389 years ago. So they really did go back pretty far. Yeah, anything that has Lord in the name usually means it's pretty old. It's pretty old law. So so because of this. Um, it didn't have, a, it would have not had a red flag, the Lord Coke decision from, you know, because now the Supreme Court has cited that as good law. Yeah, now it's <laughs> still valid to realize. 390 years later. <laughs> uh, do you, um, do you still, do you see advantages now to companies perhaps considering international strategy, uh, patenting strategy out in light of Lexmark? I, I think that that. So we always try to focus, especially in these discussions, and I think whether you're outside counsel or inside counsel, we want our advice to serve a broader business interest. We want to give business-centric and business-focused advice, whether it's on a, a litigation and a dispute and you know when and how to resolve it, or if it's internal on strategy and, and IP, portfolio strategy, more than, you know, sometimes it, it, these legal issues can be a little esoteric and it's hard to tie it to business. The Lexmark decision is really, really integrated with 
business strategy and business decision, especially, um, you know, it's got a lot of domestic implications, but it's got international implications. So with that preface, I'll get to your question. Your question is, does Lexmark change how you might approach, uh, you know, international patent protection? Yes, very much, and here's why. So if you have product being sold in a foreign, an, an international jurisdiction where you don't have great uh, IP protection because you didn't focus on that for whatever reason, I mean, you just that if that's the state of affairs, you sell there, that sale there can now, under Lexmark, come back and really have a significant effect on your what U.S. rights you might have. Mm -hmm. So if you are selling there and your price is low because you are in a crowded market because you don't have a lot of IP protection, that low price sale in the foreign jurisdiction can sort of come back to haunt you in the U.S because it exhausts your patent rights in the United States, even though it was a foreign sale. And that's what Lexmark tells us. Um, and, and so I do think that in a comprehensive way, you need to think about, yeah. it kind of shrinks everything because now you need to be thinking about these things in a more integrated way. Mm -hmm. Say, what's my strategy in Europe? What's my strategy in Africa and Asia? And how might those sales there, now that I've been thinking about Lexmark, impact um, you know down the line is somebody going to import that product into the US and sell it because I will have exhausted my patent rights by making the sale in you know, France mm -hmm. so I think it is important to think about IP rights broadly and what protections you have and, and what your markets look like uh, internationally so that you can sort of sync those up that that makes a lot of sense so I think you know one one thing as a patent prosecutor is we always look to what the market is and whether it supports the filing of international patents. And maybe part of this is you want to have a broader, um, you know, arsenal of international patents in order to help and keep your price the same or similar to what it is in the U.S. market because now there's going to be this international effect. Uh, by any sale that's outside of the U.S. I think that's exactly right. Um, and a really a, a, an important business takeaway from this Lexmark decision. The other thing that I, you know, I think we have to talk about, and we've got a couple slides coming up on it, of course, but um, to me, when I first read Lexmark, um, on my first reading, I was, I, I wasn't like, who cares? <laughs> I was like, all right, the, you know, it's a Supreme Court decision on patent. I'm going to read this and, and think about how it might impact uh, my clients, but it wasn't obvious to me how it impacts my clients on the first read because I'm like, this is a pretty unique business model for that Lexmark has where it's trying to retain some control over the product after it sells it. That's not always uh, the, the model that I think about, but when I started thinking about it, and as we'll see looking at some other industries, I think that the impact will be a lot broader um, than perhaps I, I'll just speak for myself, as I thought as a, the very first time I read through the case. It took me, it wasn't obvious to me, oh man, this is going to impact everybody, but I think the impact that you have described about saying, let's be more thoughtful about, um, about, uh, our international strategy is a, is a good one. But I think that as we talked a little bit about other business models that may be affected, you uh, might be surprised that perhaps your company's business model or your competitor's business model might might fall, fall under that uh, category. All right, so on that, we'll um, kind of what you touched on as outside, other types of business models that could be affected. <clears throat> so the, one of the big ones was the pharmaceutical industry, and it goes exactly to that international exhaustion issue that you brought up. And I mean, we hear all the time about how drug prices are lower in uh, other countries around the world. And so this is an area, you know, where th this international exhaustion could lead to more drugs being 
imported after they are sold abroad, um, and there would be no no patent right to stop that sale in the U.S. And this goes back to what I was saying the Supreme Court very clearly telegraphed could be a contract right, mm -hmm. but not a patent right to do that. And um, so pharmaceutical industry is a big one. To the extent, um, the extent, you know, the, the phrasing I would use or the, the way I would try and think about this to say, is this, could this or does this apply to my industry or to my company or my client, is I would say, does my client or that industry, do they want to or try to have any control over the item after the initial sale? Mm -hmm. That's that's sort of the formulation I would think about, as opposed to saying, are we like printer cartridges? Just be like, do we want to have any control over this product after the sale, or once it's gone, you know, that's fine. We don't care. We don't worry about having any control. Well, and I guess the other the other main component would be if you have substantially different market prices for whatever reason, either because the market can't support it or I think in some of the pharmaceuticals there's legislation in certain jurisdictions that says it has to be reduced. And that would also, now you're selling for something at a lower price point that could then affect your U.S. market, which is back to the gray goods uh, issue that has constantly plagued, um, I think, U.S. businesses. I think that's a good point. It's... Um it takes even so I'm like trying to give a simple formulation to think about it, but it's actually a layer more complicated than that because maybe you don't care about controlling your product in the same way Lexmark did. Like, and I think a drug company is a good example of that. It's not like they only want the consumer to use it in a certain way. They, the consumer is just gonna, you know, if it's a pill, they're gonna take the pill. But it's a it's a business issue. They're worried about price imbalances, trade issues, all these other things. So the control they want to have isn't control over the consumer and how the consumer might use the product, which is what Lexmark did. Mm -hmm. um, the control they want to have is over their markets and imports and exports and a, a sort of another step away from that. So I think that that's, that's why it, it, it's wrinkles like that that can make, could make the Lexmark case really, really important. Okay. So I think um, I'll move the slide a bit because I think you have identified a few other industries outside of the printer cartridge you thought, you know, you see potential effects. Med device is an interesting one. There were amicus briefs filed um, uh, regarding med device manufacturers. Um, so, you know, here's some information about, you know, whether it's a single use, but then there was a business model for, for reuse. Um, the other one that, that comes to mind is the agricultural industry. Um, I think that there is another, uh, I, you know, you, everybody's probably heard of an iPhone. I, it's not maybe as popular as it was, but a, a, a jailbreaking an iPhone, mm -hmm. you know, and it, I think that that idea too, that you could have proprietary software running on a hardware product, actually that comes up in the agricultural industry. I mean, these hugely, incredibly expensive combines and tractors and things have proprietary software running on them mm -hmm. that you may have, you know, there's a, I read an article about like essentially jailbreaking your tractor oh, wow. to like hack the software. Mm -hmm. That type of, uh, that, that's another instance where the company selling the product wants to have some measure of control after the sale. You know, they sell the the tractor or the iPhone or whatever it is, it has software running on it that has can only be used in a certain way um, or is only intended by the company to be used in a certain way. And that can, um, it, so you have to be thinking about, is a patent a way that I can enforce that uh, a little, some aspect of control or some amount of control after the sale and, and Lexmark's saying no, and that could even be, that could be software, which, you know, I diverses phones to tractors that have yeah. software running on everything now. So we have a question from the audience. What, going now, there's now this kind of um, enforcement back to contract law, what types of uh, things do you recommend for, for a business? So one of the things, you know, is a company 
like Lexmark probably doesn't want to make people sign a, a contract when they buy a printer cartridge uh, and then sue that person for contract infringement, that customer for contract infringement, if they then send it to a refurbisher. There is a business um, consideration to say, you know, you don't want to be suing your customers. So you, companies have to think about where their other contractual relationships are, if they have resellers, if they, um, you know, what, what contracts may they already have in place that they could add protection to say, you know, this is how the product should be used, this is what we're looking for, um, and add that in. I, I think that it's a little tricky if for someone like, for a company like Lexmark to rethink, you know, how can we, can, or can we, and the, first can we, and second how can we, uh, maintain this business model if we can't use patents to enforce this. Mm -hmm. And you have to, you know, the, the Supreme Court's response is write it into a contract, yep. enforce it through the contract. But that question, while it's sort of a simple answer, is uh, I think in execution really going to be unique uh, depending on, um, I think it's going to be really unique depending on your business. And so that's the sort of thing where someone like Gina, who really thinks a lot about uh, a sort of a broad IP protection strategy and can help a company come up with that, that takes into account international operations and the business model um, and, you know, innovation, what, what the company is really innovating and working on. Now you need to add in a contract review and say, okay, is there some control we want to maintain? We're already selling this, this uh, you know, on this contractual basis and have a contract with all these resellers. How do we add this in so that we can, can enforce that? So I think that that um, is a bit of a unique, bit of a unique question for each. Um, whether it's your clients or, or you know, your in-house folks mm -hmm. about the business model you want to protect or you want to have and then how you can, can write that into a contract. But luckily, uh, all the contract drafting attorneys I know are endlessly creative, and so they find all kinds of things. <laughs> and, and maybe it's a good chance to kind of do a review of contracts and relook at those licensing and royalty rates and maybe kind of do just a holistic review with a thought to this. I think that's true. Um, you know, that to do that on a regular basis. So unfortunately, how do I say this? A lot of the disputes, uh, the contract disputes I deal with, are because the contract got stale. It really is yeah. because nobody's looking at this provision or that provision. And they're renewing the contract and they still don't look at it. And then you're like, you have a scenario that was actually somewhat uh, possible to anticipate, but the the um, the contract itself has not been updated to account for that. Um, so we'll turn it over to any questions uh, in addition to those we've uh, received throughout the program. So one comment we've received, um, or I guess a, a question, is do you have any comment about impact where you have a method of use claim in the United States and a product is used in the method sold outside the U.S.? So I think that's a great question. Um, about essentially how do method patents figure into mm -hmm. this uh, calculus. And I think that as far as what, so there's sort of a scenario that's on one side of the fence, a scenario that's on the other side of the fence, and then the, the, the gray area in between. The lawyer answer of it depends. <laughs> yeah, that's the best answer. I, I always give that answer. So the first idea is that if the, the product is sold overseas and it's whatever, you know, whether it's patent covered or not, um, it's sold overseas and it happens to be used in this, this method that has a method patent in the United States. I mean, same mm -hmm. patent infringement calculus applies. If they uh, uh, infringe the method patent, you know, whether or not they're using the widget that they bought in Europe or not, they infringe the method patent. Yeah. I think that that analysis wouldn't change. The, the question has an addendum here that actually makes it quite interesting to say a different answer of the product can only be used to infringe the patent. And I think that that, to me, is the interesting question that I'm not sure how that would come out because if the product can only be used to infringe the patent, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking of a lot of different variables. I mean, is there a 
uh, is there a patent covering it in, you know, on the article? Is there a patent mm -hmm. on the article covering it in the U.S. that you would say, okay, well, that patent's been exhausted because the item was sold. Can you still use the method patent? It's a lot dicier then. I yeah. think maybe not because if that's the only uh, reason that that, that the only thing that product can do, um, then I do think then it's likely that you would have probably exhausted the method patent rights by selling that product overseas. But it's a trickier question, um, and it, I think it's an inter yeah, it's an inter it's something I think that's good for the uh, patent prosecutors to think about too. To say, do we want a method claim? Why might we want yeah. method claims as a part of our uh, our our set of claims here, and that gives maybe another consideration you would have. What do you think from a prosecution perspective? I think that's exactly right. You know, you always want to include uh, different types of claims when you're trying to patent a product, and a method claim is always helpful method of use, and maybe that keeps in that patent claim option in the United States, even though you're selling the product out, out overseas. My gut tells me the Supreme Court would find that to be the same type of um, uh, double jeopardy, for lack of a better word, but that you're still getting, you're kind of giving that up when you sell it. But it, I think it's an unanswered question and is a great strategy going forward. Uh, so unless there's any more questions, uh, uh, thank you all for your time. And please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to either uh, Case or myself. Our information is being displayed right now. And uh, the next webinar we have, um, Oh, let me get to the credit. That's the most important part. You didn't just listen to us for no reason. Um, please uh, go ahead and email Michelle Hubble with the uh, address below, and we'll send the CLE certificates um, as needed. And then finally, to ping our next uh, interactive dialogue discussion is uh, one of the biggest things we see from in-house counsel is, what the heck do I do in China? And I have all of these problems. And we'll be addressing those. Uh, we deal with it ra rather frequently. So that's going to be uh, January 24th, 2018, and mitigating IP issues in China. Uh, so unless there's anything else, it was great. Uh, thanks again to Case. And um, we'll look forward to hearing from anybody that may have any follow-up questions. Thanks for having me, Gina. Thanks, everybody.